Hey everyone, welcome to this podcast called Ken Reads, where I, Ken, read out your letter that you've shared with me in the hopes that I can better help you understand what the F just happened between you and the last partner you were dating, whether it was in a relationship or a situationship. I look at these experiences from the lens of attachment theory. I don't just come up with thought terminating cliches like they're just not that into you or if they wanted to, they would. While some of those phrases might have their benefit in other dynamics, I try and look at this from the lens of is there perhaps an insecure attachment issue that's at play in these particular dynamics? And though I am an Australian counsellor, I am not someone who is going to be responding to these letters as if I was with a client. I'm here to provide validation, yes, but I can't provide any diagnoses on these. So even if, you know, a lot of people might understandably hear this and be like, well, that sounds like a narcissist. At best, I'll probably say, sounds a bit narky. I probably won't go any further than that out of respect to my ethical boundaries in regards to what I can and can't do. If you find this of benefit to you, fantastic. That's what I want. And if you want to submit your letter, you're very welcome to once there is obviously availability per month. And I'll happily read out and share my own two cents as to what I think has gone on in your dating experience to offer you a sense of validation for what you've been through and also to give other people listening a chance to feel like maybe this relates to what they've also experienced as part of collective healing. So with that all out of the way, let's dive in to the latest letter. This letter is from Kelsey. Thank you very much, Kelsey, for submitting this to me. And given that this one is quite on the long side, I'm thinking of doing running commentary whilst also reading it out. At the end, I will obviously answer any questions that may be given to me. And I also know for a fact there is an update to this particular letter. So without further ado, let's dive in to what Kelsey has to share. Now, before I get started, I also just want to make clear, trigger warning, there is discussion with regards to um, assault. And I just want to bring that up and say, if that is something that is obviously of offense to you, please feel free to opt out as I understand that can be a very sensitive and triggering topic for a lot of people. So with that all being said, let's dive in. Three years ago, I, Kelsey, person in my late thirties, decided to date again after taking a five year long break due to a sexual assault I'd experienced. I worked a lot on myself during that time and felt like I was finally free of baggage and could fully invest in a new partner. I was always feeling anxious, especially in my attachment style after this experience, but felt secure past that point. When I started dating, I tried to vet any potential partners carefully due to my previous experience. After a few dates with people, I didn't feel a particularly strong connection with many people, yet I matched with someone who would then become my partner. A guy in their mid forties, whom I would get to know over the next two years. After a bit of texting, he was funny, he would ask me out on a date, but I was on the way to a month-long holiday, so I asked him whether he would want to meet up when I'm back. He said, sure, no rush, and off I went. During this month, we talked on the phone daily. Our longest call lasted nine hours. The conversation flowed easily. We were curious about each other, and we made each other laugh. It was beautiful. To me, Getting to know someone this way before meeting up was exactly what I needed after my previous experience, and I enjoyed the slow pace. During these calls, I asked about his intentions in dating, and he said that he was looking for a long-term partner, as did I. He mentioned that he came out of a serious relationship two years earlier, and he'd worked a lot on himself since then and had gone to therapy. I thought I'd hit the jackpot. Finally, a man who worked on himself, and a funny, smart one as well. I want to take a moment here to say... I, I obviously I know that this isn't going to go the way it was intending to for Kelsey, but it's interesting how so many people often find that when they're getting in to these new dating experiences with someone after a particularly bad set of experiences, they become very particular about the kind of person they want to date. And it can be on one hand, so, you know, incredible to meet someone who ticks so many of those boxes, goes to therapy, is fun to be around, 
claims to be doing a lot of healing and you generally feel quite safe with them. But by the same token, it's so freaky that these same people who tell you that they want a relationship soon later turn out to be the very people that go on to traumatize us down the line with their serious intimacy and commitment issues. Going back to the letter. When I came back, we were both excited to meet up. The first date went really well. And from then on, we started spending each weekend together. Because we lived about an hour apart, you know, we took our time getting to know each other and we found ways to make it work. He was sweet, attentive, especially during the first few months. We continued calling each other every day and he even suggested to go on a trip. I felt happy and fulfilled and he seemed to feel the same way. Four months into the relationship, I offered him some drawer space in my apartment, which he refused to take because he didn't want to label things. <laughs> okay, that's a bit of a... That's where I'd say we are now starting to get into potential avoidant land. I thought that was odd because he behaved more like a boyfriend than any man that I'd ever been with. Around this time, I also discovered that so many of his so-called friends were actually people who used to date. That is a gigantic red flag right there because that suggests that he hasn't actually had closure with any of the people that he's previously dated and he's just kept them around probably because of, you know his own need to try and feel like a good person and not having proper closure. He wasn't really upfront with that. And while he told me stories about his exes, I could only connect the dots over time. While we were dating, he kept close emotional relationships to three of his ex-partners, uh-oh, including the serious one from two years before. They called each other every few weeks, but never met, which is why I didn't feel too threatened by the situation. Another ex he saw multiple times a week. She lived five minutes from his house, which eventually started causing some issues because she would call him all the time, even when I was there. The first few times this happened, she threatened to commit suicide and he rushed to help her. One day he stood me up for three hours to help her with her car, which caused our first fight. What was odd was that he spoke about this person almost as if he felt obliged to help her and he didn't have a choice to say no. I didn't like the situation, but also felt sorry for this woman's mental health and didn't want to look like an asshole by trying to set stricter boundaries. We ended up discussing his close relationship with his exes, and he said that he doesn't understand why they shouldn't be friends just because the relationship didn't work out. Oh, Jesus Christ. He told me these people were important to him at some point, and he doesn't have many close relationships, so he likes to keep these friendships. I tried to keep an open mind and shove my discomfort aside. After all, he still saw me every weekend and made plans with me. Okay, I'm going to take a moment here. This is glaring red flag territory. And Kelsey, you know, I'm not shaming you on this part for not recognising this. It seems like you absolutely did recognise this. And it sounds to me like this was very much a case of the boiling frog in that you were probably, you know, three to four months in, you're probably feeling a lot of positive feelings for this guy. And I could imagine these red flags may not have been the kind of deal breakers you were used to back in the day. So I'm not reacting this way against you. If anything, I'm reacting this way against his behavior. It's like, Jesus Christ, you know, so many people with a severe avoidant attachment style do keep their exes around. And it can be from this distorted notion that they feel obligated to these people because of their mental health issues. I trust that his exes do have mental health issues and they absolutely deserve, you know, the support they need from a mental health team, not from your ex-boyfriend because he's just enabling and making things worse. Plus, it's such a trauma bond. Many of these people are just replaying the cycle of needing to be the good person by continuing to interact with someone who probably reminds them of a previous caregiver and still trying to be there for them because they feel bad about the idea of letting them go because they feel like this person won't be able to manage without me. It's like, just let them. So no, this is, oh, it can be so frustrating. And this is also another form of self-sabotage because it stops them from actually engaging in healthy relationships because they continue to hold on and hoard all these people who they had these past connections with, but it's all dysfunctional crap. And it's not to say that they haven't had, you know, a degree of intimacy with these people, but it's not healthy love. So it's just, ugh, it's so annoying. Anyways, let's continue. Six months into the relationship, I was invited to a friend's wedding and he asked me to join him. He was, oh, sorry, no, I asked him to join me. He was reluctant and said, he didn't want it to mean too much. Oh, so that fear of commitment still perking up. 
but perhaps he could just join us my day. So he did. When the bridal bouquet was thrown, he stole it from the girl who caught it and handed it over to me. All the guests laughed and asked me, what would this mean? I was very confused, but also happy. Yeah, I bet you were. Two weeks later, we attended a party of one of his friends and while on the dance floor, he lifted me up in front of all his friends and kissed me long and hard. I felt incredibly loved. I bet you did. That's pretty demonstra demonstrative. Uh, the week after he, okay. The week after he dumped me right after having sex, it made absolutely no sense. Another week later, he started calling me again, talking for hours. Within a month, we were back together. I thought this was going to go the way of the fearful avoidant. I knew it. This felt to me like dismissive, fearful avoidant land. And I, sorry, dismissive, leaning, fearful avoidant land. Um, to me, when you were describing the, you know, the party of one of his friends where he's kissing you on the dance floor subsequently before dumping you, that in, to me, it makes sense from like the avoidance side of things. Um, and I could understand for you, it would have been absolutely devastating and such a betrayal of trust and also just like it came out of fucking nowhere. But can I just say that um, to me, this is so consistent with sort of like that boomerang avoidance style of just like it gets too close, then he comes back to you a week later. Like, Jesus Christ. You know, it, it also explains the fact that he's also hoarded a bunch of his exes around too. So, yeah, not cool. We lasted another couple of months in which he got increasingly depressed. I tried to support him, even though it was hard at times. He wouldn't communicate what was going on, was grumpy, and I started to feel that I was walking on eggshells more and more. Yeah, I bet you did. When Christmas came around, I video called my family, and he made a show of it not to be in the room so that my family would not see him. He completely refused to get to know my family or introduce me to his. We spent New Year's Eve together. And while the fireworks were going outside, we were lying in bed together and he told me the feelings he has for me are just not as strong as the feelings he used to have for the serious ex. Oh, bullshit. He saw me more like a buddy. Well, how does that explain the fucking kiss you made at the party? But thought the connection and companionship we had wasn't good enough. Okay, this is bullshit. I should mention at this point that he told me a lot about this, um, about this woman to the level that I felt like I'm living with a third party in the relationship. I should also mention that he left this woman twice as well over the course of two years, only to return to her, but eventually she couldn't take it anymore and left him for another man, which almost broke him. Yeah, well, I could understand that because classic with his fearful avoidance style, I could imagine that previous person probably went through a very similar experience to you. She probably got to a point where she couldn't handle his fear of intimacy and then eventually broke up with him because she'd had enough. And I reckon that probably did destroy him when he couldn't have access to her, like the rest of his harem of exes. And so I suspect that, oh, you've even read, you've even written this here. It seems like you and I are on the same page, Kelsey. I started learning about avoidant attachment and phantom exes, and this made much more sense to me. But man, what a painful mess this was. Exactly. I was going to say, like, to me, it seems like he only feels comfortable when he hoards his exes, but when one of them leaves them, he feels tremendous abandonment and shame. So this is all for his benefit to stave off his fear of abandonment. It's not, it, this is such manipulative behavior, by the way. He may not be doing this with malicious intent, but it still has such a tremendous impact on the people that are involved and also get hurt by this, because essentially he's playing the field, even though he's not a player. He's someone who's keeping you all you know, to make him feel protected from his big feelings rather than actually having clear boundaries, working on this fear of abandonment. And for someone who's two years into therapy, this is no shade to his therapist. It may not be something that they're even aware of, but I will say he's got so much work to do. It's incredible. After New Year's Eve, he disappeared for two weeks. Of course he did. When he finally called me again, he just told me that he didn't know what else to do. I asked whether that he meant he's breaking up. Again, he stated he didn't know what else to do. He never actually said that he's breaking up with me and essentially made me, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, um, essentially made me break up with myself. I asked whether we could meet in person, but he refused. I had some of my things in his apartment, but he never returned. I suffered immensely in the months after because none of this made any sense to me. Yeah, of course it didn't. And it took me a long time to feel better. We mostly stayed no contact apart from some emails and messages every couple of weeks. 
I told him that I have no interest to join his harem of exes. I love the fact that you used the same word that I was using before. Six months after he disappeared, I went on another trip and finally felt joy again. Good for you. I thought I could finally move forward with my life and even had a little romance. I still love my ex, but I was certain I wouldn't hear from him again. I have a funny feeling that will not be the end of that story. When I got back from that trip, he started reaching out again. What a surprise. Wanting to see me. I was very skeptical at first, but my heart still belonged to him. At that point, I'd read several books about attachment theory and empathized a lot with him. Over many conversations and a very slow process, we started dating again. I insisted he would go to therapy, but he tried to find a spot. But once things were steady between us again, that idea just disappeared and he never actually followed through. Can I just say, a lot of my clients and people who go through this, I think will really resonate with this piece because I think even though many of us understand at an intellectual level that these individuals have problems, it's so easy to still have a heart that's lagging 10 steps behind that still has so much connection with these people for a variety of reasons. And I'm not going to go too deep into being like why that is. It's one of those things where we have to have a tremendous amount of compassion that, you know, these people, yes, they behave badly, but can also show up in such ways where they're so worthy of love and they're so engaging. And I think there's a tenderness to them that makes them so lovable. And I can imagine this guy, you know, was someone who you really do have, you know, do have had strong positive feelings for. And it's totally okay that you were feeling that way. I know it obviously led to another cycle of things. Yet, you know, I just want to take a moment here to validate anyone who's also relating to this to say it's very normal for, you know, many of us to struggle between wise mind of this is not healthy and child and also love brain of being like, I don't understand this. I have so much love for this person. I can see they're hurting and I really want to find a way to make this work. When I say child, I don't mean child as in like, you know, infantile. I mean, like, inner child of being like, but I just want this and I want to find a way to make it work, coupled with all that intense love and intimacy as well, too. Anyways, no, I um, I think this is very relatable. Three months into him coming back again, his serious ex reached out asking to meet for coffee. He only told me this weeks later and said he wanted to go. At that point, he'd been broken up for four years and while I tolerated their phone calls, Meeting up and rekindling a serious friendship with this woman made me totally suspicious. Of course it would. I told him that I needed more reassurance from his side if that's what he wanted to do. I never wanted to give him the feeling that I would limit him, but I also wanted to feel comfortable in this relationship. I was wondering why after all this time she would reach out and suspected that she had broken up with the man she left my partner for. We talked a lot about this situation and it caused serious tension. Instead of me reassuring, it's in English, instead of reassuring me, he started to withdraw. He wouldn't even hug me anymore. And when I tried to approach the subject, he yelled at me, what more do you want? I'm here, am I not? I felt like the time he spent with me was more out of obligation than him actually wanting to be around with me. It was horrible. Yeah, that is disgustingly horrible. And I'm sorry that he shouted at you like that. That's dreadful. This is at the point at which I started to feel trapped. I love this man but I hated how he was treating me. Yep. I never felt like a priority. And two years into the relationship, he'd still gone on the trip with me that he wanted to take during, sorry. I never felt like a priority. And two years into the relationship, he'd still not gone on the trip with me that he wanted to take with me during the first few months. I knew that he had traveled a lot with his serious ex, but somehow with me, he didn't want to. It would mean too much. There were always excuses, Work, money, timing, etc. Yep, fear of intimacy, fear of commitment. While he told me he wanted to meet the serious ex, somehow the meeting didn't happen. Of course it didn't, because he was probably scared to connect with her and face his crap. He was waiting for her to reach out so that it would seem to me like he wanted it too much. Sorry, he was waiting for her to reach out so that it, it would seem to me like he wanted it too much. He said because of my issues with her that were mainly caused by what he said to me during the second breakup in which he directly compared his feelings with her to his feelings for me. He wanted to take a passive role in this to show me that he doesn't want to pursue her any longer. This made me increasingly anxious. I was essentially waiting for another woman whose life story I knew to make the decision when I would really feel uncomfortable. I was also sure she didn't know anything about me. While I knew everything about her, I couldn't take it anymore and looked her up on the internet and discovered within a minute that she'd indeed broken up with her partner 
which explained to me why she now wanted to see my partner. Yeah, of course it does. It makes perfect sense. And can I commend you on your intuition, Kelsey? You're very on top of this. I told him that I looked her up and that I thought the important detail of her breakup changed the situation. I didn't trust her intentions, good on you, and neither did I trust that he had actually resolved his feelings for her. Of course he hadn't. I saw myself having to sit there knowing they would meet up and rekindle a friendship and possibly more. I told him about my fears. I knew it wasn't a great look. Um, it wasn't great to look her up. But at that point, I was so anxious that I had to know. I want to take a moment here to say that like snooping on a partner's phone, yes, typically not a healthy habit to do. But there is a difference between someone who's overreacting and trying to manage you from actually doing anything. And they're so jealous and hypervigilant. They're stalking all your old flames, isolating you and keeping you from interacting with anyone who could be a romantic threat. You are reacting to this man's behavior and the way in which he has still not resolved his feelings to his any of his exes. So he is very much causing a lot of this instability in your relationship with him. And you're reacting as a consequence because you don't trust him in the way he's behaving, especially for your relationship. Um, so instead of empathizing with me, he screamed at me that I would be a crazy stalker, that he cannot trust me, that I did something so vicious he wouldn't be able to ever forgive me. My crime was that I Googled his ex and he ended up dumping me a third time. Just at this time, he villainized me and said that every attempt from my end to discuss this in person, because again, this all happened over the phone. He just reassured, I just reassured him that he, was, um, he wasn't making the right choice. I never saw him again and he completely ghosted me. I received a parcel with the things I had in his apartment a few weeks later, no message, nothing. I tried to reach out on his birthday and congratulated him, to which he bitterly replied that I'd fucked up his birthday by using it as bait to communicate again. Jesus Christ. That was six months ago. And to this day, I feel completely traumatized by this experience. He doesn't seem to question his behavior and just conveniently blames me for everything. I'm sure he got back together with his serious ex, though I'll never know. He's not responded to any of my attempts to at least have a face-to-face -face conversation for closure. Six months into the third breakup, I can't sleep. I still go through severe bouts of depression and feel suicidal frequently. How the hell do you heal from an experience like this? Have I dated a psychopath all this time? How couldn't I see this? I really tried to support him as best I could. I gave him multiple chances and I felt like I did therapy for both of us. Yeah, I bet you did. I feel like all my hard work to become secure has been a waste and you'll never take any accountability or responsibility for the way he treated me. Not at this rate. He got what he wanted and when I served my purpose, I was discarded. That is definitely one way to look at it, and I'm not about to debate that because I think you're absolutely right. Um, I don't think he was going into it for supply like a narcissist, and I don't think he was a psychopath, but I do think he has a huge fear of intimacy. And can I say one thing that screams fearful avoidant to me in big, 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 big ways was the fact that he was shouting at you when you had called him out on how you, sorry, you called him out on his behavior with his um, closest ex, and mentioned and disclosed that you looked her up on Google. The way he overreacted to that by calling you a crazy stalker and shouting at you, to me, like the way he describes it just makes me think he had a big overreaction to that particular experience. And it makes me think this is sort of in the realm of him reacting out of shame and also not wanting to feel controlled by a partner and I feel like he's projecting a lot of this stuff onto you and it's just not okay sort of behavior at all. It's a complete overreaction. And I feel like he's turning you into the villain so he doesn't feel like a bad person. I'm going to circle back to something I constantly say about these kind of cases. People who are severe, fearful, avoidant attaches and dismisses have a core wound of not being a good person. They want to try and look like the good person. Hence why this guy kept hanging around also out of wanting to maintain access to his exes. He also wanted to probably look like the good person to the mentally ill people in his life as well too, because it's how he feels better about himself. I suspect that, you know, for him, you know, this really triggered the shit out of him. And that's why he blasted you like this to make him feel better. And him also exclaiming, you fucked up, you know, my birthday by using, you know, that message as bait to communicate again. To me, it's like, bro, you had every right not to reply to Kelsey. Don't abdicate control over this. 
She also didn't fuck up your birthday. You were triggered and also probably reminded of what a shit human being you've been behaving as. And I suspect you didn't like that. It's very common for fearful avoidance when this happens to anytime they feel like a bad person to throw that back to you to avoid feeling any accountability for themselves. Now, what's interesting is that there is a little bit of an update from Kelsey on her story. So eventually he agreed to meet up for the closure conversation, which happened a few days ago. I was surprised that he suddenly agreed. We talked for eight hours. This seems to be our thing. We both like spending that time together even though the circumstances sucked. I apologize for the ways in which I've heard him and for looking up his ex. I want to just take a moment here to say, I understand why you did that, but I do think that's in the realm of fawning. You didn't need to necessarily go that far. He was surprised by that, but to me, it was important that I get to do this in a face-to-face -face conversation. He appreciated it. He explained that he was really angry at me and that's why he completely shut me out all this time. He will know shit. But I feel like all that anger was just projection. It's not necessarily fair to Kelsey. Here are a few quote unquote explanations I got during the conversation. He said that when I offered him drawer space in my apartment, he felt that anything he would put in the drawer would be lost. No, what that means is anything he put in the drawer would be used as control. That's what it means. Uh, she goes on to add, so he didn't want to put anything in there. To me, that's a thing of he didn't want to give you any control of his stuff because he was worried that you'd control him. It's a, it, that's total paranoia. He then said he wanted to try and have a different way of having a relationship. As in previous relationships, he'd always become an anxious dick and he hated being that person. He only wanted the good parts of a relationship, but none of the challenging parts. I told him that all he achieved was that, that he tried to avoid. He became an avoidant dick and made me feel anxious as anyone would who'd have to deal with that level of inconsistency. Good on you for saying that. Really love that you said that. He did meet up with his ex. They're not back together, and he doesn't want to either. He was looking for some admission of her own mistakes in that conversation, which she really wouldn't do. So he was disappointed in it. They also discussed me, and she said, it was a shame we broke up, as I might have liked it. I actually agree. But I know he would never have allowed that to happen and would rather have continued to play us against each other. He never told me once that he loved me throughout the entire relationship. He expressed that he cared a lot about me, though. To him, the fact that we kept having the discussion about the ex multiple times meant that it's an unsolvable problem. He felt like these discussions would never end, hence he left to make them stop. <laughs> he just couldn't handle the shame and the guilt. He also complained that I brought up old issues too much in these discussions. He conveniently left out the fact that the issues weren't just discussions, it was mostly him withdrawing to the level that he wouldn't really look at me anymore. Yeah, well, this is all his stuff. He doesn't want to take any accountability or responsibility for his issues. I always knew that bringing up an issue meant that I would be shut out for an indefinite period of time afterwards. We never resolved issues because he always stopped the conversation before we could agree on the solution. This is what made it unsolvable. I told him that more reassurance wouldn't, would help me. And that's when he stopped showing any affection whatsoever. He told me he's not going to stay a monk, but that he would like to keep me as a friend. No, but he, but he knows I don't want that. I cannot watch him try harder for someone else after what I went through with him. My last words to him were, I really loved you. He replied with, I really liked you too. Oh, that's a garbage thing to say to someone. Yeah, Kelsey, I just want to round out here by saying this is dreadful. Like, I mean, to me, this just seems like someone who didn't want to acknowledge the fact that they had strong positive feelings for you. They were obviously very scared of intimacy and commitment, and they projected their fears of being controlled onto you. And to me, you know, it just seems to me like this is a person who couldn't handle the fact that they had tremendous guilt and shame over using other people due to their fear of abandonment. They needed to constantly be a good person because they don't feel particularly good about themselves. And I also think too, you know, when we take a look apart from all of what I've just shared about the impact of what this has done to you, the suicidal thoughts, how this has really made you feel off the back of it, confused, hurt, traumatized, very common off the back of dating someone like this. This is a man who's very confusing. And to be fair to you, if you don't understand the signs of avoidant attachment, you know, you're probably not going to pick this up. It is a very subtle thing to identify when you're going through these experiences due to the nature in which 
it's something that you know shows up usually very subtly and the signs are not obvious unless you've gone through it and you're like oh yep this person's still maintaining too much contact with their exes they're picky about labels with the relationship they're scared of actually putting their belongings into my space because they're worried about you know being controlled this is stuff you just learn over time anyways i'm going to round out here by saying kelsey i'm terribly sorry that you went through it with this guy i could understand this was probably one of the most traumatic things you've been through and thank you for sharing this story with us and to anyone who's interested in submitting a story like this to me you're very welcome to just want to let everyone know that the availability for Ken Reads will open up again come uh, next month. And if you can also submit your letter as per the instructions on there, that would be fantastic. And I do hope that for anyone listening to this, including Kelsey, that it has offered some validation and some support off the back of this experience, as it's a pretty awful thing to go through. And finally, I very much look forward to speaking again about another person's letter soon. So I look forward to engaging with you all again with the next letter.